Hello, and welcome to today's training, Effective Use of Cognitive Strategies to Enhance Effects of Exposures for OCD, presented by Lada K. McGinn, PhD. I am Mary Geis, uh, Director of Programs here at ADAA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening uh, using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Also, in order to remain compliant as a CE provider, we have embedded four different letters that will be presented both visually and verbally at intervals throughout the webinar. In order to receive CE credit, attendees must be able to list all four letters in the webinar evaluation. I would now like to introduce Lada K. McGinn, PhD. Dr. McGinn is recognized internationally as a leader in OCD, anxiety disorders, stress reactions, depression, and CBT for children, adolescents, and adults. So now I'm going to pass the screen over to our expert. Give me one moment, please. All right, and Dr. McGinn will take us away. All right, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, I appreciate uh, ADA inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm also excited to be talking to all of you about how to use cognitive strategies to enhance uh, treatments uh, for OCD. Um, so what I'm going to do, I guess from what I gather, Mary, we're going to be doing questions at the end? Correct. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, let me get started by uh, just telling you that uh, the resources here on this slide that you'll have a handout of, um, you know, much of the talk is from these resources. Uh, there are two books, and then there's one of them is a handout, which if anybody is interested, I'm happy to send it along to you. Uh, it was an article I wrote for the independent practitioner. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you please share your screen so we could see the presentation? Oh, I see. I didn't. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Fantastic. And you can just click there. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so these are the resources I meant. They're also on your handouts. Um, so um, let me get started um, in t t talking about OCD. So one of the central things about OCD is that uh, it is uh, a disorder plagued by doubt. So this is a picture of Dr. Samuel Johnson, who is credited with uh, creating our first dictionary. He was a man of letters. He was a poet as well. And uh, he had, uh, we have sort of retrospectively diagnosed him with OCD. He had elaborate rituals. He would, you know, um, you know, do certain hand gestures when he climbed over a threshold and so on. Um, and so uh, one of the things he writes is, oh God, grant me re repentance, grant me reformation, grant that I may no longer be disturbed with doubts and harassed uh, with vain terrors. And so what that sort of reflects is how wretched OCD can be and how it's the performance of rituals that uh, terrorize uh, in the long run people who have OCD. Um, okay. Mary, okay. All right, so I was having a little difficulty changing the screen. All right. so. Um, Basically, in terms of basic facts and figures on OCD, it's a highly prevalent disorder. It used to be thought to be quite uh, rare. Um, there are gender differences. Um, in pediatric samples, we find uh, there are sort of men are overrepresented, about two to one, whereas in uh, adult samples, it's about equal or women are more likely to have it. Um, we won't be going into this too much, but one of the most exciting sort of uh, developments in terms of understanding how to subtype OCD is about understanding sort of early onset versus late onset OCD, uh, which uh, look quite different. Uh, in general, I, either way, it's a very gradual onset. Uh, it's a stress-sensitive condition, uh, waxes and wanes in severity. 
Um, and it rarely remits on its own. It's uh, common across cultures, uh, and the good thing is that the treatment also is effective across cultures. So um, one of the things is that the impairment in functioning in OCD is quite high. So first of all, uh, people wait about an average of seven years before they come for treatment, and the WHO uh, data really reveal that for adults, it's uh, sort of the 10 top causes of disability in the world. So there's a significant impairment that you find, and there's a lot of burden on caregivers as well. Um, so, for example, a patient of mine, uh, you know, a single woman, she was raising four children, and uh, it became clear that they were all absorbed in her rituals. So one of her rituals was that she would... Um, you know, unplug every appliance in the house. So you can imagine how much time that took every day. And so uh, there was a lot of sort of burden on her children um, uh, unbeknownst to them. So what we know is then the DSM-5 OCD is now its own category. It's been moved out of the anxiety disorders. Um, even though it is an anxiety disorder, it has been moved out to recognize uh, uh, you know, similarities both in terms of symptoms, neurobiological features, uh, types of treatment, um, all these symptoms from somatoform, impulse control have all been moved to the DSM-5. Um, and, and so OCD is now its own uh, category. So essential symptoms of OCD, we all know that people have obsessive thoughts. Everybody has obsessive thoughts. However, people with OCD have recurrent, persistent ideas, unwanted thoughts, impulses or images or ideas which they experience as intrusive or inappropriate and that these cause significant amounts of distress. Um, one of the striking things about OCD is that the thoughts are unwanted or uncontrollable and that's because um, they're often in direct contrast to their value system or belief system. So often they can be repugnant, obscene, offensive, threatening, um, and they are resisted. So um, one of the, another striking things about OCD is how heterogeneous it is, and which makes it very difficult to diagnose. A student of mine did a, a study in my lab that showed that 50% of primary care physicians misdiagnose OCD. Um, so common things are contamination, fears of harm, however, they're obsessive, um, aggressive obsessions, sexual obsessions, religious obsessions, which are harder to diagnose for people. Uh, and also somatic obsessions. Uh, the need for symmetry or order or exactness is another type of symptom. Uh, and often to complicate matters, multiple themes can be present and they may shift over time. Um, compulsions are previously thought to be repetitive behaviors, but they are could be behaviors or mental act and they are resp uh, performed in response to obsessions. And the goal is to re uh, reduce the anxiety from the obsessions. So what's striking about obsessions, I mean compulsions, is that unlike obsessions, they are motivated, they're intentional, they could be overt or covert. So for example, it could be something as overt as hand washing, or it could be you know, a series of eye blinks that my patient did to sort of uh, shut out the obscene thoughts that she had in her mind. And that they're performed in response to distress. So it could be a specific fear consequence. Um, it could be just general anxiety. Uh, often they'll report a feeling of completeness, and that's when they know when to stop. Uh, and they're done to prevent obsessional thoughts as well. And one of the things that we'll go over today is how to use cognitive strategies to actually help understand what the feared consequences are, even if the patient initially does not have access to them. So like obsessions, compulsions can be quite heterogeneous. So common ones are washing, cleaning, checking. However, there are others seeking reassurance, uh, repeating routine behaviors, words, phrases, the list goes on. And again, like obsessions, they can be multiple types in one person. The other thing is that it could also shift over time. So for example, a patient of mine had a lot of hand washing uh, symptoms when she was in school, um, had a resurgence um, back when she was in college. At that point, she had more uh, counting rituals. So, however, there are other neutralization strategies as well that are less uh, understood or less commonly sort of diagnosed. Um, so one is that we do see passive avoidance in OCD. 
So that's in, unlike, just like other anxiety disorders. The other is people with OCD can do a lot of over-analysis in terms of the meaning of obsessions. And this can, this can take a very um, sort of ruminative quality and, and has the function. The function of the behavior is to actually reduce anxiety in the short term, which makes it a ritual. Um, they can also use distraction strategies. Um, the other uh, lesser known uh, symptom is the need to confess. And people with OCD have this urge to confess to sort of satisfy often their feelings of guilt. Um, and so, for example, a patient of mine who has sort of homosexual obsessions, even though he's heterosexual, when will on a date uh, confess to his uh, the date that he has, um, you know, homosexual obsessions. And so you can imagine how the date goes in that case. Um, so uh, slowness is another um, ritual. Uh, so I have a patient who will spend a lot of time slowly talking about things so that I can exactly understand what he's saying. Um, so again, the function of the behavior makes it a ritual. Um, most people with OCD do suppress their obsessions, and that is a ritual. That is a safety behavior as well, just like the others. Um, so what's key is that link between obsessions and compulsions. And one increases anxiety and the other reduces the anxiety. And this is also there in terms of the link in terms of content. So people who have contamination obsessions will have decontamination rituals. People who have fears of harm might do checking, might do seeking reassurance, and so on. So they often go together. So let's take a look at intolerance of disarray. So the people who have that need for symmetry will spend a lot of time ordering, organizing, and arranging things. Um, so go, moving to treatment now, exposure and response prevention is certainly the first line evidence-based treatment for OCD. Even compared to pharmacotherapy, the effect size or the strength of the treatment um, is 1.21 when you look, look, look across studies, which is very high. Uh, versus a very moderate effect size for pharmacotherapy, about 0.5. Um, however, um, there are obstacles to exposure and response prevention. Now, uh, there are it, just because there are obstacles doesn't mean that you um, then don't do it. However, all that means is then you have to work through the obstacles. Um, so for example, there might be low motivation on the part of the patient. Of course, low motivation on the part of the therapist is also a factor, and that's something that also needs to be addressed because oftentimes therapists are reluctant to do exposure and response prevention. So uncovering that motivation and sort of working to increase motivation and, and addressing fears and anxieties about doing it is, as, an, as an example, one of the ways you might overcome that obstacle. So there are other obstacles to EXRP, like non-compliance. Patients just won't follow through with the assignments. Sometimes there's a high degree of over-arousal. Uh, you know, that can be dealt with by maybe uh, making the hierarchy much sort of um, less anxiety-provoking to start off with. So there are many things that, you, that we could do to circumvent the obstacles. What we're talking about today is how to use cognitive strategies to enhance or overcome these obstacles. So other obstacles include dropping out, and sometimes people don't habituate uh, to, to um, the, the exposure sessions. And sometimes symptoms are more complex, um, and there might be multiple emotions other than anxiety that you're dealing with in OCD. And sometimes people just have an insufficient response. Um, and then the final obstacle that we'll go over today is that you know treatments all treatments for OCD can become ritualized in and of themselves. So that's something that we have to take great care not to do. So cognitive strategies may be used to maximize gains for complex patients, um, increase client motivation and willingness to engage in exposure and response prevention, um, reduce excessive over arousal and dysregulation. So part of the job is done before you even start exposure and response prevention. And then modify multiple emotions beyond anxiety, such as guilt, shame, anger, and sadness. So let's take a look at guilt. It's an intrinsic part of OCD. Um, people with OCD have been described as having a tender conscience, um, uh, something I, I like to call a hypersensitive uh, conscience disease. They have greater guilt, higher moral standards, uh, and the thing with guilt is that it may not decline with exposure and response prevention. 
another emotion we commonly see in OCD is disgust, more common in contamination OCD. Um, uh, but in, and so even though disgust does go down after exposure and response prevention, and actually when you do reduce the disgust, it actually does uh, help OCD symptoms improve, uh, we know that disgust takes much longer to go down with exposure. So uh, research shows that concurrently if you use cognitive strategies that they may improve not only that feelings of distress that people feel uh, and symptom related sort of dysfunctional beliefs that they have, um, it also might help people uh, comply with the treatment, drop out less, and what we know is that cognitive strategies when you, when, when you use them and you treat, treat symptoms using cognitive strategies, that that actually ensures that people get better. So for example, one of the things we know about exposure and response prevention now is that in, even if you're not doing any cognitive strategies, if you do EXRP and people get better, um, one mechanism through which they get better is that their cognitions are disconfirmed. <clears throat> so we know that disconfirmation of cognitions is necessary for people to get better. Um, cognitive strategies just ensures a greater likelihood that you would um, help improve and modify cognitions, so more directly addressing the cognitions. So cognitive models of OCD um, essentially um, are basically a sort of stress looking at um, not the obsessions themselves, but looking at the secondary uh, thoughts that come from the obsessions, so the appraisals of the obsessions. So these are based on cognitive and metacognitive beliefs, um, and what we know from research is that addressing both cognitive and metacognitive beliefs actually helps um, people with OCD. So let's go over uh, what the beliefs, so first we'll go over the cognitive beliefs, and then we'll go over the metacognitive beliefs, and then we'll go over uh, how to actually modify them in treatment. So here are some of the cognitive beliefs that we'll be looking at. So there is overestimation of threat, underestimation of ability to cope, uh, doubt, uncertainty, which we talked about, and relatedly intolerance of uncertainty, uh, perfectionism, and then very rigid, moral, sort of superstitious beliefs, um, and inflated responsibility, and then more recent beliefs that have been examined in, in treatment. So let's look at the first one. So we know that in general people with uh, anxiety have very high expectations of negative outcomes. So we find the same for OCD. They have unusually high expectations of negative outcomes. They exaggerate the impact of, of these outcomes and their concerns are not different and they're often just exaggerated from normal concerns, things like uh, contamination as an example. Um, in addition, when those perceptions are erroneous that that can lead to anxiety. In addition, just like people with other anxiety disorders, what we know is that patients with OCD do underestimate their ability to cope. And that's what sort of leads to the rituals. Uh, so this sort of understanding came in the 70s. Um, Tim Beck was the first one who sort of talked about um, the content of obsessions and OCD being somewhat different in that the danger was in the form of a doubt or warning. Uh, and that's what sort of distinguished OCD um, from other anxiety disorders. The other belief that we know um, uh, patients with OCD have is that intolerance of uncertainty. It appears to actually be uh, an early symptom of OCD, uh, and it's not just unique to OCD, so you do see it in GAD, you see it in major depression, um, and one of the you know things we know about it is that, and, and actually because it's so endemic to anxiety and depressive disorders, that sort of supports the idea now that there are so many, such a move towards developing unified protocols or transdiagnostic treatments and so on. Um, but one, so intolerance of uncertainty uh, is, is something that we can directly uh, address using um, cognitive strategies. The other uh, con construct that we see um, not only in OCD, but across anxiety and depressive disorders is perfectionism. Um, and this is what, when you see it in OCD, it often predicts sort of checking compulsions and not just right obsessions. Um, so what we know is that you know, both in OCD and other 
types of disorders, when perfectionism is present, it is hard to treat. So often when you are engaging in treatment for, let's say, OCD, what we find is that perfectionism as a belief is very hard to shift. So suggesting that doing not only exposure and response prevention, but also using cognitive restructuring could be helpful in this very hard to treat belief. Um, this has also led to the development of specific protocols just on perfectionism. A colleague in Australia, Sarah Egan and Roz Shafran in England have developed a protocol for just treating perfectionism. It's hard to say so far the research doesn't show whether it adds anything beyond other treatments, but um, the, I'm excited to see what the research shows in the future. The other belief that you see in OCD is sort of very moral belief. So people with OCD tend to have a higher degree of rigidity and very high moral beliefs, lots of superstitious beliefs. Um, and, and as I mentioned, they you know, have a very tender conscience. Re related to this is sort of symptoms that people with OCD have of men mental contamination. So mental contamination is sort of different from physical contamination, although it could be triggered by physical contaminants, but it's often about thinking that one is mentally, sort of morally you know, contaminated, polluted, having impure thoughts, and so on. So this is very related to this sort of moral belief. Um, so it could be triggered, as I mentioned, from a physical contaminant trigger, or it could be triggered by emotions, thoughts, and so on. One of the things we know is that religiosity is a predictor of We'll go into thought action fusion in a bit, but that um, what I want to say at this point is that it doesn't mean that people with OCD are more religious, but if they are, then the, it, it, the, the, the form it takes is of a greater morality or rigidity. Uh, perhaps the most central belief that we see in OCD is that of inflated responsibility. And this is something that Paul Slikovskis, who's a scientist in England, um, has done a great deal of work on. This came out in the 80s, where this is a key belief in OCD, although it's observed in other disorders. And so this is someone who believes that they are responsible for bad things happening. So not just that bad things will happen, but that I'm responsible for those bad things happening. So people with OCD are more likely to take on responsibility for things, even if they're not responsible, or even if their responsibility is low. Um, so, for example, I have a patient who uh, would go to a cafeteria every day and she would, um, you know, buy a cup of coffee and a bagel uh, and what she would do is give them money and then give the change, get the change back. And as she would leave the um, cafeteria, she thought that maybe the change was not correct. So she had the sense that the change would not be correct, that maybe she didn't pay the woman enough and the woman essentially would be fired because at the end of the day her boss would think that she was responsible for uh, might have stolen something so she would get very very anxious and then would go back and check with the woman just to make sure that she would do this so she took on this greater responsibility um, even though she had really no responsibility for what could have happened to to the cashier so this leads to a lot of self-blame, and although it is present in other disorders, it's just very, very prominent in OCD. What we know is that inflated responsibility um, declines with CBT, uh, and that when it does decline, it actually leads to a lot of symptom improvement. So another thing he did uh, is that he outlined dysfunctional assumptions that come from these inflated responsibility beliefs. So if you look at Beck's model, he talks about automatic thoughts and then talks about dysfunctional assumptions and core beliefs that these automatic thoughts are based on. So here, Solkovskis is outlining a lot of dysfunctional assumptions such as thinking about doing, as thinking about something is the same as doing something. So what you'll see is actually what I'm about to go through now is also now I, I'm separately identified in the metacognitive beliefs, and we'll go over that separately. But here are the five assumptions that Solkovskis identified. So thinking about doing something is the same as doing something. Failing to prevent harm is like causing the harm in the first place. And that even if your responsibility is low, like the woman who went into the cafeteria, that is not attenuated by other factors, even if the chances of that are happening are low. 
And so even an act of omission, like not neutralizing when an intrusion occurs, is like wanting that harm involved uh, in that intrusion to actually happen. And then this, the last one, you'll see fleshed out more later, which is one should and can exercise control over one's thoughts. So other beliefs more recently that have been identified, some research shows that uh, defectiveness and shame, uh, social isolation, alienation are linked to OCD. Uh, a research study done by a colleague of mine, Sabina Wilhelm, found that you know, beliefs um, not only of perfectionism and certainty, but also core beliefs of dependency and incompetence that uh, not only were present in OCD, but uh, when they got better, when these beliefs got better, that's what led to this, to the uh, symptoms improving. Uh, another research study done also showed similarly that uh, beliefs of being a failure or emotional inhibition, um, once they got better, that people got better. So now moving on to metacognitive beliefs. So metacognitive cognitive just means thinking about the thinking. So one is just a belief you have, like I am responsible for something. The other is a thought about my thought. So one is that people with OCD, and we'll go over all of these, but here's the list, importance of thought, control over thoughts, heightened cognitive self-consciousness, thought action fusion, uh, beliefs about rituals, and meta-memory beliefs. So importance of thoughts is that the people with OCD take their thoughts very seriously. They take them to mean that it means something, there's something wrong with them for having it, and so on. So they place a great deal of importance on their thoughts and also believe that they could, as Paul Tilkovskis identified a long time ago, that they should exercise control over their thoughts. So they can't, they have to control their thoughts. As a result of these metacognitive beliefs, people with OCD try very hard to suppress them uh, and in fact it has the contrary purpose which actually serves to increase obsessive thoughts the old adage you know stop thinking of a pink elephant and then all you do is think of the pink elephant the other thing that more recent research has shown is that people with OCD have a heightened cognitive self-consciousness um, what that means is they place a lot of attention a lot of hypervigilance on their own internal thought processes. So just like patients with panic disorder will pay a lot of attention and be hypervigilant to their physical symptoms, people with OCD pay a great deal of attention on their own cognitions and that this is leads to more symptoms and modifying their sort of cognitive self-consciousness can lead to symptom improvement. The other uh, metacognitive belief identified in OCD is that of thought action fusion. So where people with OCD have difficulty separating cognitions from behaviors. <clears throat> and this is re very related to the inflated responsibility. So for example, if I think that some, I think that something bad is gonna happen, so I have a patient who thinks that if she thinks that her mother will die, that her mother will actually die. So naturally then she feels more responsible and this leads to not only thought suppression, but leads her to do a lot of rituals. You do see this in other disorders as well, is just very prominent in OCD. So Adrian Wells has also identified other related fusions, such as thought event fusion, where thinking about something may mean something not only will happen, but maybe it means that something has already happened. And then thought object fusion, which is that if I, my thoughts, memories, feelings could be uh, moved on to another object or onto somebody else. An extreme form of this is sort of morphing, where people with OCD often think that, they think that they will be morphed into somebody else, or their thoughts and memories will be morphed. Um, the other metacognitive beliefs is the, are the beliefs about their rituals. And so their rituals are, uh, you know, that, that if I do the rituals, or the other flip side of the magical thinking, which is that if I do the ritual, it'll prevent that person from dying, it'll prevent my mother from dying. And also lots of beliefs about when it's okay to perform and stop a ritual. So sometimes it is about length of time and so on, but often it's about, you know, feeling like it's, they, they feel an internal sense of completion or perfectness. Um, 
<clears throat> and then uh, beliefs about memory. So metacognitive beliefs about memory is that people with OCD, so there's a lot of research where people are looking at to see whether people with OCD actually had poor memory, but what we know is that people have poor memory just for certain things, uh, things that are that, what they're anxious about, th things that fill them with doubt. So what we know is that they fear that their memory is not good. So there's a meta-memory belief that I'm afraid my memory has, has failed me and maybe I did run over somebody or I, I, I forgot, maybe I forgot that I didn't do this. And so the interesting thing about this belief is that we know that when you check, research shows that when you actually engage in checking rituals, that actually not only makes you more likely to lose confidence in your memory, so have greater meta-memories of the problem, but also it can actually impact your memory. So that's sort of interesting research. So then if you take a look at all these sort of cognitive and metacognitive beliefs, we have to go, move towards how to actually implement them. So now, first, of course, we provide a rationale. Obsessions are normal and that a faulty appraisal style may underlie the dysfunction. So it's not the obsessions themselves that are the problem, but it's the way that obsessions are processed that is a problem. So the presence of these secondary automatic thoughts and then the core beliefs, the core cognitive and metacognitive beliefs and the assumptions on which they are based is sort of the fuel that drives the engine of OCD. And that when they do compulsive rituals that actually strengthens these beliefs and these maladaptive coping behaviors. So when they engage in a maladaptive coping behavior, uh, it goes on to reinforce that behavior, the function of the behavior is that it not only reinforces future uh, maladaptive behavior, so if they do a ritual, it makes it more likely that they'll do a ritual, but also it strengthens their beliefs. Uh, so it doesn't, rather than chipping away at them, it actually strengthens all their beliefs. So let's take an example. So for example, my child will die because I just had an obsession about him dying uh, is the automatic thought. This is based on a dysfunction. Uh, if I think about doing something, it's the same as doing it. Um, and the belief that ultimately this is based on is themes of responsibility and harm. Another example, I want my child to die, and if I don't ritualize, it will be like I killed her. So this is based on the assumption failing to prevent harm or failing to try to prevent harm. It's like causing that harm in the first place. And this may be inherent and implicit in this is the belief that I'm evil, morally bad person. So we know that there are characteristic beliefs, such as inflated responsibility and so on. We know that there are metacognitive beliefs, such as importance and control of thoughts, thought action fusion. However, how do you address them, right? So you are using cognitive restructuring to normalize and modify believability of faulty appraisals but you're working at the level of the automatic thought. So you're normalizing obsessions and then you're working at the level of the automatic thought to actually help the obsessions and compulsions decrease. So just, just like a, you know, a good CBT person, you're doing a chain analysis and you're identifying secondary automatic thoughts. So I have a form called the automatic thought law that you, you know is sort of the part of the chain that you will do. Um, and I'm happy to send it to anybody who's interested but um, the goal is to increase awareness of these anxiety-provoking appraisals. So in doing a chain, you would identify the event, triggers, you know, the automatic thoughts, feelings, and then the behaviors, and ultimately, of course, the consequences of those behaviors. Uh, so by identifying them, you're helping the patient separate out what the obsessions are and what the actual secondary automatic thought is, which reflects the beliefs that we've discussed. So Next, you normalize and have them accept symptoms, obsessions are normal. You help them not to suppress the thoughts and you allow them to sort of have the thoughts, obsessive thoughts flow in and out naturally. Uh, we'll talk more about behavioral experiments in a minute, but behavioral experiments are conducted to help patients direct attention towards obsessive thoughts and not suppress them. Uh, and then you're examining the validity of automatic thoughts. So there are many ways that you can do that by examining the evidence, helping go to the worst case scenario. Is this way of thinking helpful to me? Uh, what would I tell somebody else? All of those have the purpose of distancing the person from the automatic thought. Uh, 
The one that I find the most helpful in OCD is to help them look at alternative, less threatening explanations. So rather than focusing on what, what the thought is correct or not, which is hard to do in OCD because many of these thoughts are far away in the future and so it's hard to disprove them, it's really helpful to go over just widening their perception. You know, in anxiety, we know that your perception gets narrow. This allows them to actually widen their perception and take in different possibilities. So this might be helpful as a reference that reflects the beliefs that we've discussed. So common distortions that you see in OCD, so for example, if you look at the ones in yellow, personalization, self-blame, if I don't check the gas stove to see that it's off, it's as good as saying that I want him dead. So this is an easy reference for you as a therapist to, to look and see um, you know, what, what, what belief might be triggered, what could distortion is occurring. And then after that, your goal is to modify how much they believe that secondary automatic thought. So you do that, again, through guided discovery, logical reasoning, and we'll talk about behavioral experiments in a minute. Um, so you're targeting both, and ultimately you're using, uh, you're, you're coming up with a more realistic, logical um, dialogue. And again, I'm happy to send people the revised thought log as well. So here are some guidelines for actually revising automatic thoughts. And this is not something that you would actually give to people with OCD. Uh, but this is a reference for you as, again, as an easy reference to make sure that the automatic thoughts that you're modifying are key, um, you know, are reflect key beliefs for them. So, for example, experiencing obsessions will not cause harm to myself or others because thinking is not the same as doing. This is, in, in other words, this is the learning that you want to make sure that your patients have after you modify their thoughts. But again, this is not something in this prescripted way that you would ever give someone, particularly with OCD, uh, who can sort of help um, you know, make, make things ritualized. So these are just examples that reflect the beliefs we just went over. So the other thing is that um, when you do exposure, right, you're doing it for a long time, you're waiting for the anxiety to go down and help them habituate, or at least have it come down, and then you repeat it over and over again. Uh, when you do a behavioral experiment uh, for when, you, when you're enhancing sort of doing cognitive therapy, um, you're designing these behavioral experiments that might take about five minutes, really. You don't need to do them for longer. But the intent, the stated purpose and the complete intent is to disconfirm cognitions directly. So you might do tests their beliefs of harm, thought action fusion, responsibility, or metacognitive beliefs, right, control over thoughts and so on. So for example, let's say a patient who has fears that she will uh, kill her mother, I might have them have her uh, in my office, have her imagine that she, you know, thoughts about me dying and have her think about it as she's sitting with me. So that's a behavioral experiment to again test the belief, you know, thinking about something is the same as doing something. You can also do that in terms of testing the impact of checking. So by helping them see that when they check, their, their, their beliefs actually increase in the long run, and when they don't check, their beliefs actually reduce in the long run. Similarly, you can do a behavioral experiment where you have them check in one instance to see what impact it has on their memory and their confidence, and then what happens when they don't actually check um, what happens to their memory. So the idea is really of doing a behavioral experiment is to test out the automatic thought the function of it's not necessarily to actually reduce the anxiety. And ultimately then you are assessing the, the effectiveness of cognitive restructuring. Um, so in that moment, even though you're ultimately over time looking for uh, changes in their beliefs, uh, you're working at the level of the automatic thoughts. Uh, and so you're looking at that moment to see whether obsessional anxiety decreased, whether behaviors have changed and so on. And over time, you want to make sure that beliefs have changed. So there are a few complications to be aware of in doing uh, cognitive therapy, just like doing exposure and response prevention. Um, so one is that identifying automatic thoughts can, can create anxiety. Um, in OCD, there is an additional problem where sometimes writing down automatic thoughts worsens obsessions, again, that comes from that belief that thought my that thought action fusion, that if I think it, it will happen, if I write it, it will happen. So one way to sort of <clears throat> work around that complication is 
to say that avoidance is a natural reaction to anxiety. Um, break the anxiety, break it into smaller tasks so that way you can make it manageable. So for a patient of mine who had fears about his child, his wife, and other people in his life dying, we started by me filling out the automatic thought log, then he filled it out, but I then we filled it out about his wife and then ultimately about his child. So this is, uh, that helps with this uh, complication. The other complication is that, uh, again, like EXRP, that if you do kind of therapy, substituting revised thoughts could, could make it uh, ritualized. So they could use cognitive therapy not in the way it's intended, but use it in a ritualized fashion. So one way around that is to ensure that you first identify automatic thoughts because we know that identifying automatic thoughts can create anxiety. You also caution against pitfalls beforehand. You caution against routine. So these are not people that you would ever give flashcards to. Uh, and then you modify the process if it actually becomes ritualized. Um, so that way, given that they have a very tender conscience, this is easy. So you kind of warn them in advance that this could happen. So let's not make things routine. But if you do wind up doing something ritualistically, then let's modify what we're doing. And then they uh, let you know. But again, just like uh, you know, this is not a reason not to do cognitive therapy. It's a way to sort of overcome that complication. And then you want to make sure that in addition to sort of directly targeting targeting cognition so that they change, you also want to make sure that cognitions are just confirmed following EXRP. So we know, as I mentioned earlier, that, this, that basically if cognitions get disconfirmed, it's necessary for exposure to be effective. You may also use it as a guide to terminate exposure. So recent research on inhibitory learning suggests that you don't necessarily need to use um, to, you know, the, the amount of anxiety a person has to terminate exposure because how much anxiety reduces in a session doesn't necessarily predict treatment outcome. But a guide you could use is other cognitions that's confirmed in the session itself. Uh, and that way it allows you then know when to end exposure. The other is you can consolidate it. Again, this is research coming out of inhibitory learning, which is doing a mental rehearsal after exposure. So asking participants what they learned about the fact that the feared event didn't occur. So I have a form called the Testing Automatic Thoughts, which again, I'm happy to share with anybody who would like. But basically, before doing exposure, you could have them predict what they think is going to happen. And then after exposure is done, you could then ask them, so it's so, so, okay, so let's say you First, have them test it and say, what do you think will happen? Then you're doing exposure. You stop exposure when their cognitions are disconfirmed. And then you say, what did you learn about the fact that the feared event didn't occur? And you're trying to point out that discrepancy. And that is to consolidate that learning in that moment. And also helping patients actually tolerate catastrophic outcomes. So, um, for example, if uh, something bad happens to them or you can design something that, that is tolerably bad that you can, when it's ethical, that you help them see that they can actually tolerate catastrophic outcomes. And this mod helps modify the belief that um, you know, where they underestimate their ability to cope. So the final thing that I'll leave you with is flexibility and variability. So one of the things we know is that when you vary things, I mean, you're doing treatment, whether it's exposure, cognitive restructuring, et cetera, you know, you, you vary different stimuli as opposed to systematically going through a specific hierarchy, right? It allows more opportunities for cognitions to be disconfirmed. It also helps them learn and retain what they've learned, non-emotional material. It enhances the memory storage of things that they're learning that's new. It also helps pair the information that they're learning with, with cues that can be helpful. Uh, and we know that if we do things in different contexts, uh, that you know, it's less likely that anxiety will come back. But the biggest reason to really focus on flexibility and variability, in OCD in particular, is that pretty much anything can become ritualized in OCD. It's, 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 and so you want to make sure that everything is flexible. So these are, in fact, patients where you don't have them do things systematically, you know? Why don't you do this today? Why don't you do that today as opposed to systematically going through a hierarchy or systematically giving them flashcards or doing anything systematic? 
So doing things systematically is sort of the enemy of OCD. So making everything flexible and variable uh, is helpful. So that's where I'll end today. Um, and uh, if people have questions, I'm happy to take them now. Great, thank you so much. We actually do have a couple of questions already. Um, the first one is, um, can you please translate the 1.2 versus 0 0.5 effect size into layperson language so that I can give this information to my patients? It's very striking and important data that I did not know. Right, so basically what you can say is that if you look across studies, the strength, you know, when they do research studies, they look at how the strength of a treatment so what we know across studies is that the strength of exposure and response prevention overall uh, is much greater. So even if, let's say, you're doing an exact one comparison, you know, you're comparing medication to therapy, um, you're looking to see, you might find that, you know, they're pretty much equal. But when you look across studies, what you're doing is you're combining effects of many different trials. And effect size is just a measure that they've come up with to measure how strong a treatment is. Uh, and so you could just say to, to your patient that we know that across studies, the strength of EXRP is, is greater um, than, uh, than medication, so that's a more moderate uh, strength. And one of the reasons is that uh, not only does exposure and response prevention and CBT in general work, but it's also more durable. So we know from treatment with OCD that patients with OCD um, uh, just respond sort of moderately to medications. And the other striking thing is that when you stop medication, the symptoms come back very rapidly. Up to 90% of um, uh, people get symptoms within the first two weeks, which is kind of unusual of other illnesses like anxiety, depression, other anxiety. It might take a few months, you know, might take a few weeks, but this comes back very quickly. So that's, that's, a, that's how you would present it. Thank you. And we do have another question, but uh, as a reminder to everybody, um, you can still submit questions through the chat pane in your attendee control panel. Um, okay, the next question is, will you please address the argument that just doing EXRP changes cognitions without these needing to be directly addressed, um, as I think uh, FOA has shown? Yes, they can be. So absolutely. So what we know about CBT is that, let's, I guess I'll address it in two points. So one is that um, yes, you may not need to do exposure and cognitive restructuring. Uh, you might, you know, if you can get cognition, cognition to change after doing EXRP, that's fine. However, there's two things to keep in mind. One is that um, people, you need to get to the point where they'll do EXRP. So, for example, in NFOA studies, you know, often it's sort of intense treatment. People are, people come and they do it for a couple of weeks. You know, let's say for the average practitioner where you're doing therapy once a week, um, you know, getting people to actually do it uh, and stay on um, is, is important. And so not only for them to stay on, for them to actually come back after you've done EXRP. So this is a, a way to make, make it easier where you're increasing the client's sort of willingness uh, to do exposure uh, and stay on. So sometimes people have very, very high degrees of arousal. An example that I'll tell you is um, this is, a, a, this is a, a study done in a different university from where I am. Uh, somebody was telling me about the story where she was treating this man with the XRP. He came in, he was a married man, he had homosexual obsessions. She started him on exposure. Um, he got, you know, uh, excited by the thought of sort of getting rid of this quickly, was very engaged, did it. So he had the willingness to do it. However, the arousal was so high uh, that he stopped coming for treatment. He got so freaked out after he did it. So this just is another uh, tool that you can use to uh, educate patients, help them tolerate distress. Uh, it also ensures that cognitions are just confirmed. Um, that's one. Uh, and the other is that, you know, uh, the studies done by Abramowitz and all show that it's very hard to separate um, behavior from cognitions. So most studies, you know, let's say most studies that do behavior therapy have cognitions, um, also deal with cognitions. So, for example, the panic control treatment, even though it's largely a behavioral treatment, does have cognitive elements. Um, and then there are studies that, you know, for example, when you do a cognitive therapy, you are doing behavioral experiments, so there is the behavior. So, in general, when you look at 
studies that purely look at cognitions and behaviors, the effects are about the same. However, I will say that if you have limited time and you can only do one, I would definitely go with exposure and response prevention. The data are there uh, since the 50s. It's a long time, and a lot of treatment trials show it. Uh, just combining it with cognitions just helps the treatment um, sort of uh, go better for patients, but also it ensures durability. Thank you. Uh, another participant is asking if you could please touch on how some patients may be reassured by cognitive structuring, um, especially as related to mechanism of intolerance of uncertainty and doubt. Yeah, that, that could definitely happen. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that you are uh, you're not sort of reassurance has sort of a general function. So you're helping the patient uh, you, you, you modify their own cognitions. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are providing them with that reassurance. So you are helping them modify their cognitive beliefs. They are working to do that. And so you can set up ground rules. Uh, and the good thing with people with OCD is that they have a very tender conscience. So they're not going to, uh, they'll tell you when it's when something is getting ritualized or is serving the function. And it's easy to figure that out. If you do careful chain analyses, you can figure out what the function of the behavior is. So like I was saying earlier, when anything can become ritualized, as an example, any treatment can become ritualized. Um, essentially, the way you want to find out if something is having the desired purpose, which is to modify their cognitions, is to figure out whether or not it is creating that sort of immediate relief that then has the function of increasing uh, compulsions in the long run. So if you were to do cognitive strategies and let's say it's having the inadvertent effect of uh, reassuring them, you will know that because if you do careful analyses, you will find out that it ultimately is it getting better or is are they having more and more uh, reassurance in the long run. So that would give you that guide. Okay, and lots of questions coming in. The next one is, what does the research show in terms of effect effectiveness of ACT strategies such, a, such as cognitive diffusion have on anxiety associated with OCD? Um, I would say that, you know, I, I, that's not necessarily uh, something that I've researched thoroughly, but compared to uh, CBT, the research are less. I know there's a research study looking at mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that's just being designed right now. So there are acceptance-based strategies to help with uh, seeing whether or not that helps with um, the diffusing cognitions, uh, helping with reduced compulsions and obsessions, and they are uh, probably all in their sort of preliminary stages. There are a few studies looking at it, so I think there's more to come. I think given the research right now, the, the greatest amount of research studies is for exposure and response prevention, so that is definitely the treatment of choice. Um, cognitive therapy has a lot more. Um, and that meaning following, uh, so the second phase uh, sort of CBTs have the next and most amount of research and then finally the acceptance space uh, has some exciting things coming up but still a lot more to go. Thank you. Um, many of our uh, participants are very interested in those forms you referred to so if you wouldn't mind um, Dr. McGinn sending those to me and I will get them out to, to all of those that attended today. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, next question. How do you respond to patients who state that a dreaded outcome did not occur in, in an exposure exercise or behavioral experiment or that the content of an intrusive thought was less meaningful because it was brought on intentionally and thus that this is meaningfully different from a spontaneous intrusion or feared outcome? Um, yeah, I think this is something that we face in general when we do anxiety treatments where you know, let's say just the presence of the therapist is reassuring or it feels not the, not, not the same because either you're there or it was intentionally produced um, or it's not the same degree of strength, etc. cetera. Um, and one way around that is to really combine as many exposures that you can do. So for example, if, um, you know, helping them either go up higher in the hierarchy or combining different exposures, you could even do some uh, in, interceptive exposure to bring on some anxiety and then pair it with uh, things that would routinely make them anxious. So it's sort of that, and again, it doesn't mean that you have to do all the work as a therapist, but if you're collaboratively working with the patient to say, well, what will make you anxious? Um, so for example, I have a patient, not an OCD patient, a panic patient who 
uh, has that quality where nothing we did initially, whether we did the receptive exposure or exposure, would not bring it on because he's like, I know this is not a panic attack. Intellectually, it's different, and you would never make me do something that was dangerous. So what we did is we really had him, the things that he got anxious about, you know, was being on a plane, and so I combined him wearing a very sweating and hot, feeling hot were symptoms he feared, uh, and feeling dizzy, so I had him wear lots of sweaters. Um, I had him, you know, hyperventilate uh, before he went on the plane, um, had him spin around in the bathroom, and then he went and sat down. So what that does is it basically increases the likelihood uh, of, of the fact that he would get anxious. Um, so similarly in my office, that's what I would do. I, I turned up the heat in my office. I had him, you know, spin around the room and then start doing the imaginal exposure uh, about being on the plane and having a panic attack. So that often helps. Okay. Um, it was brought to my attention that the four letters, and I missed this, were not um, embedded in the presentation. You know, so I, I, yes. <laughs> so you know, I think, Mary, what happened is I sent you the handouts, and I right. took them, out and I don't know how it got saved into my PowerPoint. I, I saved it as a PDF, and then I okay, sent that, it to you. So I, I, my, I realized that as soon as it started, I'm like, where are those letters? That is okay. So for those of you that are still with us, I'm going to now announce the letters that you need to um, put in the evaluation um, to earn CE credit. And we will just use, today we will use E, X, R, P. So again, if you're seeking CE, those four letters are E, X, R, P. And we will move on to the next question. Um, I am unclear as to the goal of the EXRP. I thought that the goal was to help the patient tolerate the uncertainty of their obsession, i.e. that they will get sick from touching something, rather than disconfirm the belief. Well, it depends on what, the, what, what it is. So there's many different reasons to doing EXRP. So the traditional model was that you're breaking the Maurer's two-stage theory, you're breaking the conditioning cycle, you are unpairing the association between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Uh, you are also looking to uh, habituate to the anxiety. Those were sort of, when I went to graduate school, that's what we learned. Um, recent research obviously shows that uh, when cognitions get disconfirmed, um, that's when people get better. We also know from research in inhibitory learning that um, that you know, basically, that fear reduction in the session really doesn't uh, impact treatment outcome in the long run. Um, so again, uh, as far as your specific questions about intolerance, if the patient has intolerance or uncertainty, yes, then the purpose of doing exposure would be to help them tolerate that uncertainty and not engage in any kind of ritualized behavior to get that certainty. So. Um, these are all sort of mechanisms of action that we look at in, in terms of doing EXRP, but there are uh, many reasons for why you would do it. Can you talk a little more about when ethical pair CSUS occasionally to help patients learn that they can tolerate catastrophic outcomes? Can you give yes. some more examples of when this would be appropriate? Uh, sure. So, for example, you might have them touch um, a doorknob that's been touched by somebody who has a, a cold. Now, you wouldn't normally do that because why would you want, it, want them to get a cold? Um, or let's say if you take a look at something other than OCD, let's say someone with social anxiety, you might have them uh, actually do something to uh, intentionally humiliate themselves socially. And the reason is, well, it is a condition, it's, it's, it's really unconditioned stimulus, and anybody would be embarrassed in that situation, for example, or most people would not want to want to touch a doorknob that has been touched by somebody who has a cold. The reason, when ethical, you might do that is because, uh, you know, you're trying not, not just to teach patients that bad things don't happen, but you're also trying to teach them that when bad things do happen, that you can tolerate it. So uh, that's part of what's really, really an important part of OCD treatment, which is that you are helping them take um, calculated risks. Because ultimately, OCD and other anxiety disorders are disorders of caution, where they spend so much time uh, avoiding danger because they don't think they can handle it, uh, 
Um, and so part of what you're teaching them is that you can handle it. So of course, when ethical meaning you wouldn't do it if um, you know something terrible would happen to them, but you would do it if they got a cold. That's on a balance. Getting a cold one year but being free from OCD over the long run, it's a pretty good balance. Does that okay. does that help? Yeah. I think that it does, and that brings us to the top of the hour. I want to thank you, Dr. McGinn, and to all of our participants for attending today's training. Uh, once you leave the webinar, you will receive an evaluation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, you will also receive a follow-up email um, with a link to view a recording of the webinar, so you'll have that available to you as well. And I really hope that you'll join us in San Francisco for the Anxiety and Depression Conference 2017, uh, where Dr. McGinn will be giving a master clinician session entitled Comprehensive CBT for OCD to Maximize Gains. So on behalf of ADAA and our presenter, thank you for joining us today, and just have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.